Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the internets is Joe Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Na 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 bat song. Na 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 bat dong. Na 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 bat dick. Na 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 bat prick. Bat wong, bat wang, I'm out of slang. Wait, bat pole, bat wood. Okay, I'm good. Na 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 bat peanut. Yeah. Holy mother. Of all that's hanging, he who thought he'd circum he, he circumcised. Yes. And if you got your issue and you need some fast cash, the lowest price one on eBay right now is fifty nine dollars. And some bobo's got his slabbed. It might even been autographed because it had the yellow CGC thing. Uh, one thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. By God, that's a lot of money for one little dick. I would have expected for him being a playboy, he would have been a, just a little bit better hung, if you know what I'm saying. But we'll never know. The next issues will be gone. Uh, Won't be no, no more, no more schlong. Digitalized out. It's just like Japanese porn. They're going to digitalize it out. Uh, did Did you uh, buy buy the comic and or read it? Well, if if I'm lucky, because if you remember, I've I've I last time we did previews two months ago, I was asking, well, where's issue number two? And you said it's bi-monthly. So I should be getting it in box day. And by that time, I'll take a look and see if it's uh, uh, worth just flipping it and going to buy a second print copy. Because the comic we're talking about is Batman Damned, number one. Um, the comic that uh, was part of the Stephen Colbert monologue Friday night. Oh, that's Steve. He's, he is very topical. Um, now, I have not read it, but I hear that the nudity is what they call incidental. It's not sexual nudity. It's basically he's uh, walking around the Batcave naked. Not like we've seen that before. I mean, and we, we've seen that, you know, all the way back in, in Dark Knight, you know, when Frank Miller had him standing on top of the stairs naked. Or was that Nat Rat? No, it was, I think, both of them. Yeah. But we didn't see uh, anything because they use shadows. Yeah. And um, everybody's saying, oh, oh, this is, it, it, Marvel would never do that. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they would. <laughs> well, uh, they, did. they already did. Remember that Spider-Man story where his radioactive sperm gave Mary Jane cancer? Oh, man, that's an Earth I hope never came back after Secret Wars. <laughs> Yes, there's a page where Spidey is sitting on the edge of his bed, and uh, we get to see his little web. 61 bucks. The, the Jim Lee version is going for 61 bucks, and the auction's ending one minute. So, I mean, that's a legit price, people. Let's, see, let's, let's go. Uh, let's see if I can find. Oh, there's some Jim Lee sign. Yeah, I gotta go. What is the highest price one on the Ebays? $1,000. It's a Jim Lee cover, 9.8, signed by Jim Lee. And this guy's pre ordering him. So he... And that's for the Batman, He's not the Bat Spider Man. Uh, and here's Fruit Van. Yeah, yeah, Batman. Nobody cares about Spider Man. I mean, that's passe. And if you want 30 of them, by God, $761. But free shipping. The world is going Batwang. I'm telling you. We are all over Batman's dick. I'm telling you. Even Oprah's on it. She is? I didn't know she had a show anymore. I didn't even know she had one. <laughs> so, and, you know, there's a, there's a couple copies. There's the regular and the Jim Lee, and, and uh, you know, people are just going bug nuts over that. I mean, I should have gone to the source last week and, and picked up myself a copy of the Batwang, but, I, I, I mean... For the sake of the creators, should we just call it Batman Damned? Because I'm, I'm really yes. getting off. Batman off Damned. Yeah. And by the way, it's not the Batwang. It's Batawang. Batawang. It's a bat pole. To the bat pole, dick. Ha, ha, ha. Here's my question. Why? I don't know. I to, yes, to it's me. their new adult line and everything. But if it, you're just going to do incidental nudity, yeah, Batman's wandering around the Batcave naked. You shadow cover it up anyway, because you know this is probably, it's not, 
it's going to get you publicity, but most of the publicity has not been good. And I guess you could use the old, you know, all all publicity is good public. Corey, 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 you're being too hard on DC. <laughs> oh God. Hey, they're they, they just they're like right. This is my zone right here, man. But they had to figure out some way to get this out into the public consciousness because, again, Spider Man showed his web spinner. No one cared. Matter of fact, I no bet if you cared. looked up uh, Spider Man Requiem. On, on the Ebays, you could probably buy the whole set for, I don't know, dude, a, a, a ham sandwich. Because nobody cared. Nobody cares. And, and uh, let's remember, at the end of uh, Batman number one, when they did the new 52, he and uh, Catwoman are boinking on the roof. So, for some what reason... What did Wonder Woman call Superman? You sperm bank. I mean, what do you expect? This is the new 52 where the Amazons would basically use the men, castrate them, and toss them over. Where she actually went up to a black man with a collar and said, here, put this on. I mean, this is the new 52. Actually, that was you know, a Grant did. Morrison Earth One story. Yeah, but it's after, it's after Flashpoint, so it yeah. counts. Well, yeah, but it's not in the new 52 years. No, no, don't be making other excuses. Universes. Don't be making it. It's all part of the moment. Get your universes right, man. I, well, if, 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 if you know, Spider-Man can go around giving cancer to people just by having sex with them, you know, what the hell? <laughs> so now, There's a team up waiting to happen. So if you would have had a comic shop, how would you have sold Batman showing his capeless crusader? Oh, at about a hundred bucks a pop. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have bagged it? Uh, <laughs> so, so one, that, that, you see, that's the pun that makes me laugh. Would you have bagged that sucker? <laughs> no, nah, well, what? I don't I'm know. Batman does condom sleep condom. around, so. Well, you know, bad condoms. You know, hey, DC, we're giving you the money, million dollar ideas here. So, you know, and, and my guess would be. This probably would have uh, been sold out before you'd have a chance to bag it. So you really you gotta you gotta pre-bag things. You know what I'm saying? Just don't count on the other person to bag things for you. I will say this: DC was kind of uh, putting this out there. <laughs> the way they did is kind of a shitty trick. Do you think? Nah, I'm not gonna go there. I was gonna talk about you know. Like a mirror universe where Batman was black, that would have been like a center fold out, right? No, I'm not going to go there. I, I, I won't. Please go there. don't go there. I won't. Go there. Uh, hey, once you go back, you never go black back. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't help. <laughs> we got to change the topic here. I I do think that DC should have said that there was nudity in this. I suspect. They probably weren't paying attention to it, just like when Alpha Flight came out with North Star coming out. It was just, eh, whatever. And then, I mean, could, think about the first person who opened it, and where where, where did they alert? Who did they alert? Like, ah, uh, I better call Comic around, Newsarama. I see a penis in my comic. Or they turned well, on the bat signal. Maybe you better stop reading in the bathroom, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but, uh... No, I don't. But I got it. I'm sorry. I've been watching Whose Line Is It all weekend, and I just, I'm just, I, I, I can't help myself. We're gonna, we have just earned that explicit uh, language rating forever. Oh no, we, we earned that DC. ages ago. Now we're just, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're just coasting on it. Well, yeah, we earned it back then, but now it's more. We're, uh, it's not adult language. It's, you know, it ain't. You, Annoying 14-year-old boy language. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh at anything that even sounds funny. No, we but laugh the, at the sad that part sounds is, sexual. Get the joke right. Yeah, but I was going to say something right. poignant. Oh, I doubt that. You're being a prick. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, honestly, until we get our box day, we really can't comment more about this bat prick controversy until I read the damn the book. So I imagine once we do get our our hands on it, <laughs> I'll probably go blind. I mean, 
It's the only comic you could go blind reading. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for the hardcover. <laughs> Can't take you anywhere, can I? Nope, nope. Just Perkins. Can't even take you to Perkins. I can only take you to the car Target food court. Well, listen, if you don't want to talk about bat dogs, there's one thing we can talk about. What? For... I give you, I give you your opening there. Take it. Well, y you do know that there's a new podcast coming, right? I, I, it's... How many are you doing now? One, two, three, four? No, six. Yeah, but there, it wasn't called Fantastic Six. No. Although, you know, there are times it should have been. Okay, I'm going back to the bad pricks. Uh. But uh, Adam Vermillion, who did Panels and Pizza, which no longer exists because he doesn't eat that much pizza with people anymore, he and I started a new uh, podcast. We're uh, It's kind of a spinoff of the series in review. And we're going to take a longer series than I ever thought we would have. We are going to do the Fantastic Four in the Fantastic Forecast. Ooh, very punny. Yes. Um, we're going to do four issues of the Fantastic Four in every podcast. It's going to start as monthly. And then uh, once I uh, have weekends off, we're going to be doing it uh, probably every two weeks. But we will be doing... Every issue of the Fantastic Four. We will also be talking about the appearances in um, Strange Tales, when the Human Torch had his own series, Marvel 2 and 1, uh, the Things solo series. Uh, but those are quite a ways away. Well, actually, Strange Tales is not that far away, but Marvel 2 and 1 is a way away if we're only going to do four issues. Oh, man. That's over. That's over. I'm going to carry the two. That's over 50, 50 podcasts. Yeah, see, Corey doesn't want to, you know, run out of podcast ideas. So let's just pick a series that has so many issues and crossovers and six or seven different volumes <laughs> that he's just guaranteed to podcast himself into an early grave. Or, I mean, it's not like you picked a, uh, like Batman to do. I mean, come on. Or it may make me live forever. No, I don't think so. Well, that's that's my theory, and that's what I'm going for. So, you know, you're telling me you can get four issues of Fantastic Four in in an hour, huh? Well, not a, not the first episode. Oh, oh what, did you start with negative one? No, we we, we just did the first four issues, but it's a two and a half hours. Well, that sounds about right. <laughs> but uh, that's going to be why, coming why in you October. Why didn't you go for four hours? Well, is because, it coming out October fourth? No, no, no. It's uh, we we'll have the date soon. I gotta, I gotta sit down and talk to you about promotion here. You're just you're missing it. I know. <sighs> What's the theme song going to be? I, Does Fantastic Four have a theme song? I, that's all Adam's job. <laughs> Adam is the one mixing this one, so it's like, hey, you just want me to talk? I can talk. So you say it'll take forever? Yeah, pretty much. But uh, coming soon, yet another podcast. And uh, there are rumors that another podcast may start by the end of the year. Oh. But I may not be involved in it. Huh? You can't hide your own comments. That and uh, you, you and a couple people on the Facebooks are trying to get me to do yet another podcast. Yeah, we're trying. You know, you, you gotta. You, one of these days, something will catch up. That would be seven podcasts. <laughs> well, you are a network. That is true. You, free as you may be, if there's going to be some type of value, you gotta you gotta have stuff there. So so go ahead, list them off. Okay, there's uh, this one, the crazy comics and stories. There's these, one of these days, we'll actually talk about comics. And uh, there's uh, the Solitaire Rose podcast, which is my solo podcast. So that's two. Um, three would be um, uh, Bad Advice with Wolfie and Corey. Uh, four. Did would, you ever think you'd find yourself working with a puppet? I've been working with a puppet since this show started. Hey-oh! Uh, no, number four is Novelcast. 
Uh, number five is series in review, so now number six, fantastic forecast. Uh, there are other podcasts. There are two podcasts in this network that I'm not on, Joe. There's Scrabbling Through the West with Dave Capel and his lovely wife, Stephanie. And then there's uh, Solo Joe. Solo Joe still exists, right? Well, I, I brought Joe back. I guess I shouldn't mention Solo Joe, should I? No, I'm not. I'm not. Oh, damn it. All right, he duct taped me to the chair. But okay, fair enough. And you like that. Well, yeah, from, you know, our depressed redhead with pie. You, <sighs> you can have the red heads. I'm into those tremendous brunettes. But that's not what we're here to talk about. No, no, we're here to talk about bat winker. No, we're here to talk about the war. Oh, oh! You mean Comic Gate? Did you know the Comic Gate released a uh, hit list of enemies of comics, and we're not on it? We need to work <sighs> harder. I'm, I'm a little disappointed. <sighs> Funny, I, I looked at the list, and most of the people on the list have won Eisners. They yeah. they hate comics so much uh -huh. they're winning awards I, for them. That'll teach them. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go make a movie out of it. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about. No, we are here to make more bat jokes. You're here to make more bat jokes. I'm here to talk Darn. about comic book adaptations of movies. Boy, that's a letdown from you know bat wankers to new podcast. Well, not you know, really, because you know, let's remember, I do have the worst porn ever made. Bat pussy. <laughs> I talked about that in a previous episode. Yes. They made porn boring. <sighs> Damn them. But no, uh, movie adaptations. Uh, we were talking off air about movie adaptations a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, you know, we haven't done a really good episode on movie adaptations. Um, and it's kind of weird because I feel we have, but... We've actually talked about different things movie related, but never just one podcast, just t totally talking about it. And also, you know, we've talked course, about. If you had told me last week we'd be talking about bat wings, I would have, I would have said, "What took us so long?" <laughs> we've talked about you know series based on on things. You know, the Buffy series, Star Trek, Star Wars, all that. But we've never talked about actual movie adaptations. And um, back in the uh, 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s, Marvel and DC did not do them. There was only one company nope. that really did them, and that was uh, Dell. And the reason was they were out on the West Coast. So they had access to all the movie studios. Now, some of them were... You know, they did adaptations of the Disney movies. They did adaptations of big budget blockbusters. They also did adaptations of movies like uh, Horror on Party Beach. And you have had this one in your shop, Joe. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Yes. So I might still have it because I have a bunch of Santa Claus books or Christmas books somewhere. So they ain't all glorious. Glorious! But Dell would put these out, and usually the movie company would give the rights as either um, they, for some movies, they would actually sell them in the lobby as souvenirs, but they also saw it as promotion, because movie distribution was very different until basically the 70s. They wouldn't make a lot of prints of a movie. You wouldn't have a movie that would open all over the country on the same day. There would be a certain number of prints, and okay, it's going to start in the big cities like New York, L.A., Chicago. And then after a while, they would move it to smaller theaters, and then they would move it around the country to the point where when The Godfather came out, I remember my parents waited months for it to show at a local theater. Because that's how it worked. The movie would play in the big theaters, and then eventually it would go to the smaller theaters. So if they put out a comic book adaptation of the movie, it was promotion in that, oh, look, this movie's coming out. And they would usually have a still photo from the movie on the cover, and Joe likes those uh, photo covers. 
Yeah, I I guess we didn't have that in the cities because you know there was always theaters to go to. You know, some may be an exclusive, but uh, there was always some theater that you could go see whatever the movie is. And of course, the big thing was is you had to look in the paper if you remember, you know, daily newspapers to make sure the movie you wanted was at the theater you wanted to go to because they may only have two screens and they're only showing two movies. So if they didn't have your movie or it, it might have been like an exclusive release only for a certain movie, you know, you kids in your fancy Metroplexes and, you know, yeah, we got 25 screens and 27 of them are showing the new movie. So, <laughs> But I, I worked at a movie theater in the, what, 2010 when the theater chain AMC said, we're not going to pay for movie listings in the, the in the newspaper anymore. We've got a phone line. We've got a website. There are all these websites. People can get, and oh my God, did people lose their minds. And well, I know one thing. People stopped going to Harmar. They were in AMC. They would go somewhere else where they could figure out where it was. Right. That was the thing. We started getting tons of calls because I don't see you in the paper anymore. Are you still open? So eventually AMC realized, you know, maybe newspapers don't sell real well, but you got to have your listing. You got to pay for that listing or people won't think that your movie theater exists anymore. Back back when uh, Dell was king, they did all the movie adaptations. And then, you know, as we've talked about in the past, Dell um, ended their association with Western Publishing. Western created their own company called Gold Key, and they continued doing the movie adaptations. But by the time you got to the 70s, Western was kind of, uh, well, they weren't dead, but they certainly didn't look good. I will tell you one thing about a lot of these movie adaptations. The cover was the best part of it because, boy, you get inside it, and if you were lucky, the artists actually knew what was going on with the movie uh, use stills or whatever, uh, you know, like the Music Man one. And I haven't looked at it in years, but I do not recall the uh, inside looking like Robert Preston at all because they did not have the rights to use the right the likeness, but they had to make it, you know, so you knew what this story was. And a lot of them just weren't that good. I mean, you can understand why if you could find some of those Dell and Gold Key movie adaptations in mint shape, you have a true collectible because, boy, no, nobody thought to hang on to them. They just weren't that good. Uh, that said, the only one I know that's actually uh, I enjoyed reading was the Gold Key Yellow Submarine because they wrote their own puns and jokes and things. It was almost like you were watching an alternative version of the movie. So it was a lot of fun. And in a lot of ways, that's what they were dealing with. They had a longer uh, lead time back then. So they had to work on these things. They had to be done, you know, three, six, eight months before the movie came out. Sometimes the casting wouldn't be done yet. They'd be working off the script. And you talked about how, well, they didn't have stills. Well, there weren't, there were a few where they hadn't even started filming when they started work on these adaptations. But the first movie adaptation I can think of from Marvel actually became a joint Marvel-DC because Marvel had got the rights to do an adaptation of MGM's Wizard of Oz, whereas DC had got the rights to do an adaptation of the book of the Wizard of Oz. And since Marvel was further along, they figured, well, rather than uh, have a big fight over it, they would co-produce it. Uh, John Buscema drew it. Roy Thomas wrote it. And as far as I know, that was Marvel's first movie adaptation. Other than um, in some of their regular comics, they did adaptations of The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. But those were part of anthology series, believe it or not. Uh, Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And if was, says it, you better believe it. Well, Golden Voyage of Sinbad was actually in Worlds Unknown 7 and 8, which had started as a science fiction anthology. But I, you know, looking back, I can't find anything until you had um, Wizard of Oz, then you had Logan's Run, 
which um, Marvel thought they had bought the rights to do a series based on it, and they found out two issues into it that, no, you didn't. <laughs> and again, that was what I just talked about, too. They did not have the rights to use the actor's likeness. So Francis had, like, hair like a, a rock band musician, even though the Francis in the movie did not. And Nate Logan didn't look anything like Michael York. And the character who was Farrah Fawcett just kind of had the hair. Yeah. And even then, Farrah Fawcett wasn't like, Farrah Fawcett! She was just happened to be in a movie, and boy, did they, you know, expand her role. <laughs> oh, she's in this movie! Yeah, but she dies. Oh, sorry, did I give something away for a 50-year-old movie? <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, Marvel Damn. also did adaptations of the Planet of the Apes movies in the uh, Planet of the Apes magazine. And those were done long after the movies had come out. And it must have been successful because that and Master of Kung Fu were kind of their two longest-running um, non-Conan black-and-white magazines. Now, when did 2001 come out? 2001 came out in 1976. So that was uh, eight years after the movie. Which makes no sense at all. <laughs> but it was by Jack Kirby, so I don't care. We don't care. Um, it, it, like the uh, Wizard of Oz, was done as a treasury edition. And uh, Kirby doing 2001... I saw the Kirby adaptation before I saw the movie and read the book. So when I watch the movie and read the book, I have Kirby's visuals in my head. You must dream in Kirby color. Well, there's a lot of uh, Kirby dots. Kirby crackle. <laughs> but no, when I see the movie, what because Kir everybody had their own interpretation of the ending. I have Kirby's interpretation of the ending because that was the first way I saw 2001. Um, DC did not jump into adapting movies till the 80s, but there is a movie adaptation that uh, both Roy Thomas and uh, James Galton say saved Marvel Comics from bankruptcy. Joe, does Joe know what is the movie adaptation that saved Marvel from going under? Batman 66. No. No shiny new diamond for Joe. Proud of me I, did, I, I didn't even make any Star Wars reference. <laughs> That's what it was, Star Wars. No. I mean, it sounds like we did a whole episode on Star Wars. Well, and I, as I said at the time, Stan Lee didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. Those kids and their flashy stuff. Just give me a string and a rocket cone and I'll show you how to do it. Well... Lucas was the first filmmaker to actually go to the San Diego Comic-Con the year before the movie came out and showed test footage because he thought that's his audience. And when he was there, he uh, grabbed Roy Thomas and said, I want Marvel to do an adaptation of my movie. And Roy took it back to Stan, and Stan said no, and uh, they argued about it. What's, what people say now... Second and third hand is that the Roy convinced him to do the adaptation because Sir Alec Guinness was in it. I find this story to be hogwash. <laughs> because why the hell would anyone care if Sir Alec Guinness is in a movie? Well, if you drink Guinness beer, maybe. Yeah, but it's not like, oh, this science fiction movie. Ah, uh, let's pass on doing an adaptation. But it's got the, the guy from uh, School of Scoundrels in it. Oh, well then, I have changed my mind. Oh, you mean Ron Jeremy? Sure, we can do a double spread. The guy from Rafifi is in it. I think it was more that Lucas really pushed for Marvel to do an adaptation. Roy Thomas was excited about doing it. And uh, Roy had been right about Conan. So Stan kind of listened to Roy about things like this, even though Roy was not editor-in-chief at Marvel anymore. Listen to the Roy. So uh, Howard Chaykin drew it. Roy Thomas adapted it. And if you read that adaptation, there's stuff in there that still isn't in the uh, special edition. Yep. Yeah, a lot of things. I mean, they have that infamous scene where Luke is 
calls Biggs out to the desert and say, look, there was a fight going on up there. I saw it earlier. Uh, and that even survives a little bit because there's a – when uh, Luke's whining, I mean uh, talking <laughs> when he gets to drive, ah, oh, Biggs is right. I'm never going to get out of here. I'm a, I want to get a power converter. What do you mean he's my dad? No, wait a minute. That's the next movie. Um, or no, third movie. So, and um, you do get Job of the Hut. <laughs> no, not that Job of the Hut. <laughs> no, it's uh, if you read the Star Wars uh, adaptation, uh, Jabba is a guy with uh, big bushy a side penis burns. face. <laughs> You've got dick on the brain. Hey, I didn't even get into my bat balls jokes, so <laughs> you better be quiet there. <laughs> but he had the uh, Isaac Asimov uh, sideburns. Yeah. That was your job of the hut. <laughs> yeah. And they showed up a little bit later uh, in in the actual comic thing because that was one of the more, if not the most successful comic spinoff where it went beyond the movie and just kept going on almost a life of its own. And, and you know, we don't want to make this an all Star Wars thing, but boy, as a 12-year-old kid who was late to the Star Wars thing, because I remember looking at the ads going, oh, this is going to suck. I was, I was, I guess, I, I was a lot like Stanley in that matter, but uh, the trailer is not that cool. Oh hell no! It, it go check your YouTube's, folks. It's not good. And I remember looking at the ads, but I think there was a couple dynamite magazines I saw where it was kind of, well, it's kind of cool. You got uh, there's a couple humans and a, a shiny robot. You know, this is the scene where they're all running to the Millennium Falcon, and I thought, well, it's kind of cool. They're working along aliens. A little bit more than Star Trek. You know, Star Trek was, oh, here's the alien of the week. He's got a bridge on his head. But, uh, yeah, the Star Wars comic was just, it was fun because there wasn't any other Star Wars. I said Star Trek before. I meant Star Wars. Unlike now where, like, well, okay, I think I'll suffer and watch the prequels. Or, you know, I do like Solo. Or, you know. I'm going to read some Dark Horse and maybe some of this non-canon external extra universe, expanded universe, or maybe I'll just wait for the next one. I mean, there's tons of Star Wars. No, back then, that was it. There was like a, a Splinters of Mind Eye that came out, and I don't remember when the Han Solo books came out. But it, was it just came out in the 80s, either 79 or 80. And the comics, if you're lucky, you had the comic strip in your local paper. I don't recall seeing it so i don't think we had it so yeah it, it was it was pretty good but that's when marvel decided hey maybe there's something to this this uh movie stuff and they really jumped on the movie adaptations they did an adaptation of the star trek the motionless picture um which actually works better in the comic than in the movie oh yeah well, you know, they do have fast forwards now, so you can really make that enterprise. Okay, shoot to the middle. Which um, is probably what you would be doing if the sucking thing's approaching Earth. Not every uh, adaptation or movie was great. Your um, eyes only? That was the James Bond movie at the time. Yep, uh, drawn by Mike Bosberg, I believe. Dragon Slayer. That Which actually is, I liked. Well, well, the first issue was cool because the art on the cover was kick-ass. The second issue was just a generic comic drawn issue, and it was like, oh. But you were kind of drawn to both because if you got the first, it was usually there were two issues, and they didn't really do a collector's edition, which is two issues. But when did they start doing it in the super specials? They actually were doing the super specials first. Ah. And then they started splitting them up into miniseries. And there was even a super special that we never got because the movie bombed so badly. I thought it was they didn't have the rights to do it. But nope, I guess they it had the rights. Book. It's the movie ah. bombed. And uh, Marvel said, well, you know, the movie's already... We won't even get it out on stands before this thing's already out of theaters. Because it was printed in France. And that is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And uh, have you have you seen that movie, Joe? I have not hunted down a copy of it. I have tr tried to get a copy of the comic. It pops up on eBay's between a hundred, two hundred dollars, and I believe it's in Danish. It's not in English, so there is a French version. That's the one that I purchased. Is that what it is? 
Yeah. Oh, you actually got a copy of it. Cool. I did, and then uh, when uh, somebody offered me a couple hundred bucks for it, I said, "Yours." <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> I can't read the damn thing anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, not you know they. Let's remember, Marvel did an adaptation of Xanadu. Well, let's let's. I'm going to run down the list because I happen. I, I just looked up Super Special, so. Uh, if I don't cover it, it was because it wasn't a uh, movie. But number three, clocked in at uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Which also was a, they also did it as a, um, a treasury edition. Uh, Jaws 2 with a very voluptuous set of hooters hanging on it. You which know, is sec- what the movie poster sells. was. Yeah. Uh, the, the Number seven was the aforementioned... Uh, Lonely Hearts Club Band. And here's where I think Atomic Avenue is off the rail because they say it's Near Mint Guide is $3. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> Good luck. With luck. That now came an interesting one because this one actually had a little series behind it. Speaking of changes in the movie, uh, Battlestar Galactica. Yes. Two, two formats. There was the tabloid format and then the magazine format, which is what most of the super specials were. The tabloid had the original i how would you say i guess the original script on it yes the most notable thing is it is the cylons decide to behead baltar and that was in the theatrical version and what happened was is that when it became a tv show they decided to keep the actor around you actually see a little bit of it towards the end where they they drag baltar in and the Cylon pulls his sword, and then they say, but wait, the, the three-headed guy, I forget what it is, Imprene, Supreme Emperor or Empire Supreme, whatever. He puts the sword back, and then they, they allow him to become the human nemesis, track down the humans and kill them all. And then, of course, I, I think it was three issues in the yep. comic series. First three adapted, issues of the comic which adapted the change from the, sh- the show. And then they did the next three. The next three were or two or another episode, the Temple of the Gods, because that's where they found out we have to go to Earth. And after that, it was all original stuff. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, I'm going away in a w- meteor. Uh, 1979. I remember seeing that movie in the uh, theater. I have finally seen it. Yeah. Oof. And I got to tell you, the I, having been in New York and, and trying to plot out the trajectory of this meter, this is a miracle meteor <laughs> because it actually had to take several real sharp turns to destroy the buildings it did in the comic. Yes. We'll, 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 we'll let that go. Uh, Star Trek, number 15, the motion picture. Again, three issues in the short-lived uh, series. The comic series. What what sucked about that was that they were only allowed to use what was in the movie, and then when DC Comics got the rights, they were able to do anything Star Trek related uh, to a point. Uh, then the next one has an interesting story. Uh, number sixteen, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Yes, it was released before the movie, much to the anger of Lucas. I uh, so recall, was uh, Return of the Jedi, I believe. I do recall buying a copy, and then ne- next week, uh, my comic guy would, yeah, I'm supposed to try to get those back from you. But don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't worried. Uh, let's see, number 17, Zandu. With a photo Xanadu. cover. Xanadu. It had Olivia Newton-John in it, pre-Grease. Or post-Grease. Olivia Newton-John with her roman- romantic partner, Gene Kelly, mm. with music by uh, ELO. Uh, next was Raiders of the Lost Ark. For Your Eyes Only was number 19. Now we're into 81. Dragon Slayer, which we mentioned before. Uh, Blade Runner, which I believe was comic book size. That was not tabloid size. Correct. Annie, this is about the time I checked out. I and they were Blade doing Runner, miniseries by this time as well. Yeah. Annie, Dark Crystal, uh, Rock and Roll, which, as far as I know, was not released in theaters. Not in the U.S. 
I have seen that movie, and it's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Then came Octopussy. Oh, man, those, those groin jokes just keep on coming. Uh, Return of the Jedi, which you said had the same problem. It came out before the movie. Well, they had planned it so it would release the week after the movie came out. The problem was everybody at Marvel forgot that stuff hits the direct market two weeks before it hits newsstands. Yeah, and I don't remember the hubbub around this one as I as much as I did the yeah Empire Returns. Like I don't even remember buying. I think I did buy it. Uh, I'll just bang out the other ones. Crawl. There was a Tar Tarzan of the Apes, but it came out during the uh, oh, why can't I think of her name? That was when Bo Derek the, played Jane. Yeah. Yeah, and this this had nothing to do with that movie. I think it was just out to kind of. It was it was, an, very, it was an adaptation of the first Tarzan novel. Uh, to kind of play off it. Let's see: Indiana Jones, The Temple of Doom, Last Starfighter, Muppets Take Manhattan, Buckaroo Banzai, Sheena, Conan the Destroyer, Dune, two thousand ten, Red Sonja, which I Ooh. think was come on. I know. Oh, the comic and Mary was terrible. Oh, it was. Santa Claus the movie, Labyrinth, and the last one was Howard the Duck movie adaptation. A lot of these, when I said I checked out, I did not buy as the super special because it was cheaper to buy it as two 60 cent comic books. Yep. And you got the same two thing. Two or three. Depending on what it was. So yeah. they got their money's worth out of it. Now, was DC doing anything similar? Because, I mean, we just jumped from like. 78 to the last one came out in 86. DC did not do a lot of movie adaptations, but remember when they got Star Trek? They got it right before Star Trek 3 came out. So they were kind of filling in the gaps between 2 and 3, and then they did an adaptation of Star Trek 3. DC never did an adaptation of Star Trek 2. Nope, that actually, who? Uh, IDW did that. Yep, Just IDW did that ago. a few years ago. But DC did adaptations of the Star Trek movies. They didn't do a lot of adaptations, although I do remember very weirdly they did an adaptation of Little Shop of Horrors. I remember musical, that. musical drawn by Gene Colan. Huh. However, much like how Star Wars saved Marvel, I won't say that this adaptation saved DC, but it certainly made DC enormous amounts of money and that is the Batman movie adaptation I was working at Schindler's when that came out they did two versions they did one that Richard was Burton. the, the uh, comic book on the regular comic book paper but they also did one in the prestige format which at the time was still called the Dark Knight format so it had the uh, stiff cardboard cover and the better paper inside. And when that came out, it came out a little before the movie. We sold those off the stands. And DC kept them in print for two years. Shinders kept those on the stands. And we would sell you know, two or three of them a week, even a year and a half later. But man, when that thing came out, it flew. We sold so many of those. And I remember at the uh, MCBA Con that year, they had an art um, an art contest. And Jan Dan Jurgens was the judge. And as he's going through and judging and everything, he, he finally said, God, so many people are using the movie costume for Batman. <laughs> and it just kind of irritated him that everybody was using the movie costume for Batman and not the comic costume for Batman. <laughs> but DC ended up kind of just doing adaptations of their own stuff. And none of them did as well as the Batman movie adaptation, but they kept doing the adaptations. There's an adaptation of Steel out there. That had a photo <laughs> cover, didn't it? I believe it did. There was an adaptation of Probably the Catwoman I movie. <laughs> I don't think that had a photo cover because I would have bought that. Again, I believe. I, I believe there was on, Marvel only did an adaptation of the first X Men movie, or did they not do an adaptation of the X Men movie? And no. instead, they did the three prequel. Yeah, prestige that's format what happened. Books. In, in the nineties, 
there was a couple interesting things that Marvel did. The first one, and we've talked at nauseum about it, you had this big movie coming out and Marvel had no product out there. People would come in and wanted to buy X-Men comics and they just had the regular X-Men series, which was like saying, okay, jump in the middle of the soap opera. You don't need to know who the characters are, or what's going on. They have no bearing on what you think they are. And they're not like they are in the movie. They had, was it three, three or four, three uh, they were almost prequels because they had yeah. one, I think, on Rogue, Wolverine, and Magneto. And they basically dealt with what the characters were doing before they actually uh, were in the movie. But the problem was, is the comic book back then was uh, priced two ninety five. These things were priced like five, six bucks. Yeah. Well, they and, were prestige format. And But nobody wanted to buy them. Right. You, you had a tough time selling. I mean, nowadays... Yeah, you might be able to to pull it off considering a magazine's ten bucks and a comic is three ninety nine. But yeah, I, I distinctly recall people coming in looking for it, and I say, "Well, we got these; they tie into the movie. What about these other ones? Well, they're kind of their own thing." Blah 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 blah. blah. Sports, sports, talk sports, sports, sports. <laughs> you know, they, you're talking, and they they're not hearing. Uh, the other one that was interesting is Marvel teamed up with Paramount Pictures and came out with a Marvel Comics Paramount Pictures present line. And this they brought back Star Trek and was interesting. I think they had four series. Uh, yes. One based on Captain Pike's and they, they got to the, the Cage episode by issue four. I was kind of disappointed with that because then they dealt with like post-Cage stuff. I thought they'd deal with more before that. Uh well, that's good because now you're going to get it in Star Trek Discovery. There was a uh, oh, I can't say it. there was, there was like Star a cadet, a cadet one. Yes, where they ended up going to Starfleet uh, Academy. Yes, that's what it was. And there were there were two other books. Oh, was it Next Gen or Deep Space? No, Deep Space Nine, and then Star and Trek Unlimited. Oh, and that was the fifth one, Unlimited. Yep. Uh, they also did a Mission Impossible one shot. That With was a, a light prequel, belt cover. And it was a prequel to the movie. And this is getting important because this is what we'd started to see with the comics. They did an Independence Day one that, again, I sold tons of because people ask about it. Say, well, this is covering stories they referred to in the movie that they didn't get to like about Randy Quaid's character being abducted with aliens when Brent Spiner's character uh, ran into the, the ship for the first time, uh, those type of stories. So, and they were comic book. These were all priced like normal comic books. So they're a little bit better sell than, uh, than your other ones. But what was interesting is that they were all, they were doing the prequel thing. And that's where you started to see this coming out more and more where a comic that tied into a movie would be a prequel and talk about beforehand what was going on. And even to this day, you'll see that, especially with the Marvel movies, they'll come out and plus they have photo covers. They they'll have like a two issues series. And this is what happened beginning of Thor. This is what happened beginning of the Avengers. This is what I think there's uh, one for black Panther that just came out. I think an Ant-Man one, Ant-Man Wasp just came out. How could I forget that? And then uh, they'll probably have one for Captain Marvel right before the movie hits. But they're all prequels. They're not adaptation. Matter of fact, I don't see many comic adaptations going on at all. The ones I'm seeing are usually Star Wars. And it's weird in that they're coming out long after the movie. I know IDW did one on Transformers the movie, which again Marvel did because they, they were still doing Transformers. And, of course, IDW just did Beatles the Yellow... I'm sorry, Titan Comics just did Beatles Yellow Submarine, which I raved about last podcast. So they're out there, but I think the trend right now is not so much an adaptation where we're thinking, okay, we're going to take what's on the movie and put it into comic form because it loses something. The mediums don't... They're not interchangeable. Yet, if you can do a prequel and say, well, we're going to cover some stories that leave up to it. I mean... Did they do that with Matrix? There was a the, giveaway that got banned. I know that. The Matrix comics were things that happened that weren't part of the main comic. It ah. was stories set in that universe. 
and they were, it was an anthology. And it was weird that they only did the two trade paperbacks because I remember it sold really well. And that was before the sequels came out and people went, oh, I don't like this anymore. Venom's going to get a prequel coming yeah. out. So, you know, look for that. And again, if you like the movies, uh, it's probably something that you could pick up. I mean, I just I just Googled it and here I'm seeing... Uh, my Little Pony movie from IDW, uh, the X-Men ones we talked about earlier. Sometimes there's giveaways. Like there was the X-Men, the movie, that was a Toys R Us giveaway. Uh, there's always tie-ins. Like they have a whole universe comic tied into the Transformers universe. Uh, there's a jumper. Was, it, was that a show or a... That was a movie. Okay. I and think. then there... I, it I could don't be. remember any. And then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they had movie tie-ins. There, there was a set I just sold off the Ebays a year or so back where it was, uh, one was published by Archie, and yes. one was published by Mirage, and it was the exact same book. The Archie one was like in traditional comic book, whereas the Mirage one, if I'm saying the company right, was a prestige format. Right. But inside was the exact same book, which was kind of interesting. The uh, Archie Star one was for newsstands, and the uh, one for Mirage was direct sales. Uh, Dark Horse has one for the Predator movie, if that's just recently out. Uh, Star Trek Nemesis had Star Trek Countdown, which dealt with the issues, what happened in the original timeline before, uh, I can't remember that, what's his name, before Spock went brought his red matter over and uh, Nemo took his Borg ship and crashed the new timeline and things like that. So they're still out there. I, you know, as a comic store, would I, would I buy these things? I, you know, most of the time I'm finding, yeah, if you're a, my little pony person, you're probably going to buy it. And, uh, you know, there's tons of them that are given away as uh, premiums at stores and things like that. But I wouldn't go bug nuts buying these things because I just don't see them selling that well. I think the time for the movie adaptation is over. Except one of the things Marvel's doing with the Star Wars, they come out long after the movie, but they fill in gaps and holes and stuff. And they've also gotten more information about what's coming next. Because I hear, like, they just finished up the adaptation of The Last Jedi. And the story's about a third as long as the movie as they put in more stuff um, stuff from the book adaptation and stuff that um, D Disney has said this will be important in the next movie sort of thing but back when they originally came out you know they were to promote the movie and also because you didn't have DVD. You didn't have VHS. It's you'd see the movie in the theater, or maybe it would be on TV later. And by the time you got to the seventies, you know, you and I have probably talked about this. Where I remember in the seventies, I would read movie novelizations because well, there's no way I'm going to get to see this movie in the theater. So I read the movie novelization of The Swarm and Towering Inferno yeah, me, and oh, me too. Anything me too. Alan Dean Foster Jaws. wrote. <laughs> I was I was on those uh, even even you know the it had nothing to do with the movie but uh, there was a Superman one came out when the yes. Christopher Reeve Superman came out and the book was fantastic. Uh, I my brain's e Miracle Monday and Last Son of Krypton. I'm trying to think of who wrote it. Uh, um, it was uh, Elia S. Magan. That's there. You yeah. Oh, fantastic books if you can find them. You can buy them from him on his website, by the way. There you go. I recommend them highly. So, Joe, um, to wrap this up, what are your three favorite movie adaptations? Well, the first one I talked about was the Yellow Submarine Gold Key. Uh, it took me... I, I actually had one very early on in my comic collecting career. It, it, I picked it up. Uh, I believe I picked it up from our, our good buddy... Uh, Craig Ketter, when he had uh, Dreamhaven. Damn well, handsome man. His first store was called Twin City Comics. I believe I picked it up then. And I always remember it because the corner on the right had a double fold on it. Like somebody 
you know, you take it, fold it once, fold it twice. So it wasn't near mint. I think it was 20 bucks, uh, and it did not have the poster in it. It's one thing about the Yellow Submarine comic that came out. There was a poster in it. So if the poster has been removed, the price drops a lot. But and I, I talked about it before. It's got its own jokes. It's its own thing. I mean, between that and there was a, a hardcover book that, and a softcover book that I had had. And again, I saw it at uh, uh, Greg's shop for like fifty bucks. And I wish I would have hung on to mine. But those actually, they weren't directly adaptations. They 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 added to it. It was kind of like what you were talking about reading the books. A lot of times, especially if like Peter David or. or uh, Alan Dean Foster are writing the adaptation. They add to the to the book. Uh, there were there was. Uh, I'm trying to think. Well, like the the second one on my list, the L Logan's Run. The uh, book has nothing to really do with the movie, whereas the the comic. Again, that no actors likenesses, but you got five issues of the comic and then two issues beyond that where they tried to do their own thing. And to this day, I still enjoy it. Uh, I wish they had continued it because the only thing they left me with was a terrible TV show. Ugh. Uh, the last one, I, and I mentioned it briefly, was the Star Trek countdown. And this is the type of thing that I like, where they went in and they filled the gap between what happened from the Star Trek Prime universe to the Star Trek Pine universe. Get it? The actor Pine. Uh, I guess that doesn't work anymore. I don't think he's going to be around much longer. Uh, so that kind of filled in events that they kind of talked about, but they didn't really do it. And you're also kind of wondering, like, well, how did Nemo get a hold of a Borg ship? Uh, board technology uh, they didn't really it didn't really come out watching the movie it was something that if you read the book or read the adaptation you kind of oh it's Borg but whatever so those were those were the three that I actually enjoyed and I thought was a lot of fun and uh, Corey's got one on his list that I almost put on my list because although I enjoyed it but it wasn't exactly my favorite so Corey what were your top three favorite uh, movie adaptation the first was Star Wars and Star Wars I can't tell you how many times I have bought this adaptation <laughs> I bought it as the regular comics and I read those comics to death they're worthless because yep. I read it over and over and I, I bought the uh, Star Wars novel where I forget the name of it when it came out it was like Star Wars of the advent it, the adventures of Luke Skywalker and I read that over and over and over. Um, Howard Chaikin hates it. I don't care. It's beautifully done. It adds to the movie. It made me excited to see the movie. And let's see. I, I bought it as a comic. I bought it as a um, tabloid. I bought it as a paperback book. When uh, Dark Horse had it, I bought it as the... Uh, the, uh, Collected trade, edition. Yes, when they did the uh, Star Wars classic or Star Wars, yep. you know, whatever their classic was where they reprinted all the Marvel books. And then I bought the Omnibus. Is, so, I, Omnibuses is, 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 is what we called them on this show. I, Omnib. So, uh, Star Wars, just because, you know, it... It was a perfect adaptation of the movie. It went beyond what was on the screen. It added more to it. And that was back when, oh, Star Wars, the... Because remember how I talked about how movies used to travel? Star Wars did not make it to Canton, Illinois until the end of August of 1977. Which was weird because it stayed around for an entire year at our theater. Roseville 4 was the big one that had it. Oh, Peoria's, Peoria had a theater that showed it for a year and a half. Yeah. But uh, it did not it's come a, to Canton, a, Illinois, uh, till the end a, of summer. It's a Cub Foods now, but not for longer, because <laughs> they just sold the Cub Food chain, so they may end up closing it. So. I did but not. Anyway, drive by it, they sold Cub Foods? Ah, uh, yeah, they're looking uh, the uh, people who own it. Super value. They, yeah, they do not want to be in the retailer business. They're gonna. It's probably more profitable to be in the wholesale business. So the chain is up for sale, and if you, if there are certain rainbows around that was owned by Super Value Cub Foods that are closing, and now the Cub Foods closing. 
I wonder if the one here in Chaska is going to close. They haven't announced they're doing it. It's just something they said they they want to do. So uh-huh. it may be a while till it happens. But yeah, basically, they're I think they're giving up the. They probably looked at it and said, you know what? If Amazon's getting in it, we're out. So that's Star Wars. What what are your other two? Uh, the next one is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Dun, 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 dun. Which was well, another great Indy adaptation. Indy. Art by Indy. Al Williamson. Indy was his dog. But again, this was a movie. Now, by this time, they were doing wide releases. So I saw this, you know, within a week or two of it opening. But this was one where it was just an action-packed movie. And I wanted to read it as a comic. I wanted to read the novel. That was back when, if you liked a movie, you would, uh, you know, find every format it's in. And now when I go back, it's Al Williamson art. And even though it's rushed, it's still beautiful to look at. And then the last one I have is one that um, most people don't know about. It was published by Heavy Metal. And it is an adaptation of the movie Alien, written by Archie Goodwin, drawn by Walt Simonson, which for a haunted house movie, which is what Alien is, is kind of an odd choice. But Simonson's art really brings that H.R. Geiger stuff to life. And really, he's able to use his art to make it, you know, it starts with these big things when they're down on the planet, and then it gets progressively more and more claustrophobic. There's also one other adaptation for a movie I don't care for that I didn't put on my list, Joe. I don't care for this movie at all, but I could read this adaptation over and over and over, and I do read it about every uh, year or so. What might that be? It's uh, drawn by Rick Veitch and Steve Bissett, 1941. Oh. Also printed by Heavy Metal. I, like I said, I, 1941, I have a friend who absolutely loves the movie. I can watch the whole thing and not crack a smile. But man, the adaptation by Bissett and uh, Rick Veitch, they just go nuts. It's insane. And they shove extra jokes in it. And if you ever get a chance, if you ever see that adaptation in 1941, pick it up. Because... They, when they turned it in to get it approved, Spielberg himself gave them a note saying, this is batshit crazy. And I love it. <laughs> There's no way this would ever get approved by anybody else. So, And uh, you know, if you think about it, those are all late 70s adaptations when kind of the peak of adaptation art, art-wise. Because once you got into the 80s, Marvel saw adaptations as kind of, well, we have to share the profits with the studio, so you don't put our big names on it. Just kind of hack it out there. And you can tell because Vince Coletta inked most of them. <laughs> you know what we don't allow Vince Coletta anywhere near, Joe? Uh, bat poles? These guys, our sponsors! That's right, here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads, and our first sponsor is me. That's right, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip, Worldwide News, the story of the lowest rated cable news network. And you can get yourself a copy with commentary, with all sorts of extras, with uh, signatures and everything. Just email Dan over at LordShadowflame at gmail.com. Our top sponsor, who's been with us since day one, is DreamHost. DreamHost.com. You need yourself a website, and DreamHost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe. Just head over to DreamHost.com, put in the code CRAZY, K-R-A-Y-Z, get $20 off your first year. How can you beat that? Our other sponsor is Graze, G-R-A-Z-E. Dot com Healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle. Just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, We'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com or you can call 952-856-0519. Operators are standing by. 
Okay, it's just a place that will record your calls, but we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. And we've already talked about the other podcasts here on the uh, Solitaire Rose Network, but there's one that's not on our network, but it's our it's our best friend. This podcast is kind of our best friend, Joe. It is? Yep. It's my friend Tommy and his pal do, talking about the movie Frankenstein. They, they do it better. Here, l- l- listen to them. How do you do? We're about to unfold the story of Frankenstein. This is Tom Lang. And this is Bill Evenson. And we're the hosts of a new podcast called Frankenstein Minute. That's right. We've taken the classic Universal Studios Frankenstein films and broken them down minute by minute. And each episode, we're going to dissect one minute of Frankenstein. We'll talk about Colin Clive, who played Henry Frankenstein. Dwight Fry, his hunchbacked assistant. Mae Clark, Henry's fiance. And of course, don't forget that monster played by the enigmatic question mark. We'll also talk about the director, James Whale, and the fascinating flourishes he brought to the picture. And Mrs. Percy B. Shelley, Mary, of course, the author of the original novel on which the film was based, and the difference between the novel and the film. This really is a classic film, the one that many point to as the one that started it all. Um, Dracula? Uh, sure. But, you know, seriously, one minute a week? How long is Frankenstein? Frankenstein is 71 minutes. Are you sure we can uh, keep this going for 71 weeks? Oh, sure, no problem. I mean, this is Frankenstein we're talking about, not Dracula. Good point. We'll discuss characters' motivations and talk about the great performances and John (laughs) Bowles. Don't forget Kenneth Strickfadden and his amazing electrical devices. We'll even reveal which of the lead actors grew up in sleepy little Chaska, Minnesota. Frankenstein Minute premieres on August 31st, 2018. Where? You know, the usual places, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. And check us out on FrankensteinMinute.com and Facebook and Twitter, if that's still a thing. Is Twitter still alive? Oh, it's alive. It's alive? It's alive! Oh, I got something else to listen to now. And now that we've uh, finished up with all of uh, my plugs and all of our sponsors, we get to Joe's favorite part of the show. No, what no, no. That? Oh, I was going to make some bat ball jokes, but what is my favorite part of the show? What's going on on the Ebays? Well, you know, things have been picking up. And like I said, it's because uh, I dropped that sale and uh, some sale has been going on. I actually had a listener. Uh, I can't say too much because um, that person – was buying a gift for their other, and uh, I didn't want to say much about it. I don't even want to reveal the, the sex of whom it is, because apparently they both have their podcast. So I, I, I gave them a good deal and tossed in a couple extras. Uh, but I'll just rattle down the last couple things that sold. Uh, my Shazam collection, the, the uh, 1970s uh, stuff is slowly shrinking. I, I sold a number 23 uh it was only in good shape, so it was fairly inexpensive. Was there uh, a Penord on the on the cover? Uh, it's hard to say because the cover was misprinted and kind of uh. sideways. But it did have have uh, the big red cheese. Can the world's mightiest mortal save Earth and his junior partners from being blown to atoms? You know, and they're basically uh, it's somehow strapped to the ICBM missile coming into the earth so uh be that as it may up and at them i sold a copy of star trek deep space nine rules of diplomacy that was signed by the person who wrote it aaron eisenberg who played nog on deep space nine Corey, do you know what that book originally sold for i do not probably uh 4.99 nope this is the signed version now. The regular, the regular one. Oh, was so like this a, is the one you took to get signed. This is one where you. No, no, no. You you got it directly from Malibu. Sign came with a certificate of authenticity and everything. Nineteen ninety nine. That's what I was asking for. Originally, it was a sixty dollar book. Holy buckets! 
And, the, you know, it was a good... Well, back then, they're... Again, let's see, when did this sucker come out? Yeah, see, no eBay. So, really, this was your only way to get a hold of a something like this. 1995 is when it when it, the book come out. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. They actually did one other Deep Space Nine. It might have been a... Was it Next Generation? Where Mark Leonard wrote it, the actor who played uh, the father. He did not have an autographed version through uh, Malibu, although Malibu was kind enough to at least leave a box open. So you, if you did happen to run, luck out and run into him and have him sign it. But I always thought that that was a great idea, and I thought IDW could still do that if you were to go to uh, one of the characters, actors and say, hey, you want to write a story about your character, and we'll put it in comic format. But uh, like I said, these are the only two I know of, and it was only the one that was signed. And Corey, do you know what I sold this sucker for? Nineteen ninety nine. You said that earlier. Nope, nope. I had it on sale. Do you? And I'll give you a hint. It was fifty percent off. I do not know. Well, if you'd have said nine ninety nine, I would have said wrong. Somebody got this gem for six bucks. Wow. So mostly because you took it's a been bath on this one. Well, it, it was from the, sh the original Hot Comics. I mean, if you want to say bath, I've been sitting in my collection for how long? 95, 2005, 2000, I've, over 20 years. So, uh, yeah, it was just one of those pieces that I've had for so long. I just, you know what? Someone made an offer. I let them have it. I'm a generous guy. I let uh, a couple other books go. Corey, do you know who Frank Thorne is? Why, yes. He was an underground artist who also did a whole bunch of... Uh, Red Sonia stuff, and when uh, Wendy Peeney would cosplay Red Sonia, he would dress up as the wizard, and oh, uh, they wizard? would do, they would do joint appearances. Ooh, joint! I like that. Ah, <laughs> uh, I he, I sold two of the undergrounds, uh, the Iron Devil number one from 1993 through Eros. That's the. Uh, the dirty line from Fan Graphics, and Lan number one from 1991, same line. Uh, I do have other comics. Uh, you, if you do look at the adult-only comics, you have to go into the adult section. They're not under the normal comics, so you have to be authorized, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Star Trek Deep Next Generation Special number one from 1999, speaking of photo covers, had a really good photo cover with Jonathan Frakes on it. Uh, and, of course, it was an all 48-page Riker issue. So what do I know? This is part of that Marvel Comics, Paramount Comics line. So, uh, you know, I'd love me them photo covers. Uh, the last two things that sold, uh, Artifacts, number one. It's a, uh, uh, I believe it was the beginning of a crossover uh, through Top Cow universe. Yeah, with Tomb Raider and... Witch Blade uh, and the Darkness. Much, I, think, and I don't know if Tomb, Tomb Raider was... Well, maybe that is Tomb Raider in the background. It was a black and white variant cover that you had to get like one of 300 to get or whatever ridiculous number. Again, it was part of the half-price sale. Uh, Corey probably knows this next one. Tell the good folks about The Pro. The Pro is by uh, Jimmy Palmiotti. Amanda Connor and Garth Ennis, and it's about a hooker who gets superpowers. And if you know anything with Connor's art, it is hilariously funny. If you know anything about Garth Ennis, yes, it is absolutely hilarious. I had a third print variant. Apparently, every time they came out with a new one, it was a, a different cover, which was kind of cool. I also have the hardcover downstairs, which has a, a unique story in it. So I decided to, uh, to pick that up. Uh, and the last one, I, I don't know if I covered it, uh, Fistful of Blood. Did I talk about that last yes. time? Yeah, that sold. That was the previous week. Uh, I'm going to close this out just by saying, you know, we uh, go to crazy, K-R-A-Y-Z. Uh, the sale is 50% off select items. It goes for another couple days after this podcast drops, and then... Uh, things will just rest because then I will be going, I hope, to MCBA Falcon 2018, October 6th, the One Day Wonder at the State Fair Education Building. You need to get educated. You do. And by listening to this podcast, it's a good start. And by going to Falcon, it's even better start. And if you go to 
mcbacomiccons.com. Advanced tickets are on sale. You'll see all the dealers coming, all the guests coming. Uh, one of the guys who used to do the fabulous countdown to the comic show, unfortunately, his uh, house and car and some other things got damaged during the storm. I know he had a PT Cruiser that is now apparently a PT Pancake. And his power is out. I guess it finally went on two days ago. So whereas he's usually talking about the different guests and if they're doing advanced sketches and the dealers, he has not been able to do that. But all of it's right there on the website. So go check it out. Now, before we get into the next part of the show. By the way, you're forgetting great. something else that's going on that weekend at the state at the uh, state fair fairgrounds. Oh, and you tell me you're going, and this is the closest you're going to be? Half Price Book of Magazines having one of their uh, sales where they're clearing oh, out the okay. warehouse. You going? <laughs> I don't know yet. It depends on if I have the time to get over there. But it's uh, paperback books or what? Paperback books are a buck. buck. Hardcovers are two bucks. They'll also be blowing out DVDs, CDs, all that stuff. They, they might even have comics. I don't know. I've, I've never made it over there during it. And it's, is it Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Or yes. just Saturday? It is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, they will have uh, grocery carts for you to fill up. They are. They know, they're going to fill that grandstand, baby. Oh, yeah. I went there like three years ago, and they basically, they just set up tables and boom, here's some mysteries. Boom, here's science fiction. Boom, here's uh, old paperback uh, novels. Boom, 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 boom. Any, by the way, any book from like the last 30 years that was uh, popular, they're going to have it there. Like, you know, oh, yeah. you, you want the uh, Bill Clinton uh, bio autobiography? They're going to have a stack of them. You want all the Sarah Palin books? I'll have a stack of them. You want, uh, what, uh, Satanic Versus? The Stacks of Quantity Surveying. Woohoo! Well, give me a yell if you're going. Okay. Because, uh, well, well, I'll get to that when we get to Hip Watch. But uh, I did want to ask you one question. Uh, you had made a comment, and I don't remember if it was on show or off show, something about the reprints of the Fantastic Four Omnibus having extra stuff in it? Yes, we will be getting into that when we do. Ooh. Which, well, Joe, it's time for my favorite part of the show. No, no, no. All jokes. Oh, no, no, no. Not where I talk about how I finally found my original sin glow-in-the-dark eyeball. Ooh. It had rolled uh, under the couch. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's freaking and geeking. Joe... What are you freaking on? Nothing. What are you freaking on? Uh, I have I, a few I, things. I can tell you the truth. So, I mean, I, I really can't. I don't have much to freak on. Uh, DC has canceled the uh, Impulse Omnibus. Holy cow. What are you going to do with that West Wall of yours? You need a load-bearing omnibus. Here's the, pro here's the reason, by the way. When they went to scan the comics, the paper that it was on does not allow them to get a good enough scan for the uh, level of quality they want for the omnibus. Hmm. So instead, they'll be doing two trade paperbacks to complete, to reprint the entire series. But uh, that kind of surprises me. Impulse is kind of a recent book, and they don't have film of it. They don't have digital film of it. They have to actually scan the old comics. That's pretty weird. Very weird. Especially since they have put out uh, trade paperbacks of some of those issues. And then the uh, second freaking I have is, Joe, it's been a while, so it's time for Hanging at the Home. Ooh, let me sit back, get my Hanging at the Home hat. It's my own hat, so don't ask for one. Okay, Corey, tell me about Hanging at the Home. Well, I've talked in the past about how the group home is changing. We're going from four 12-bed facilities to a whole bunch of little three- and four-bed facilities. In order for that to happen, they've hired a whole bunch of new people. And to train the new people, they've got them in the current cottages. And, you know, how in the past I've had to work a lot of extra shifts because they couldn't get people to work weekends and evenings. These people have to work weekends and evenings if they want to keep their job. So, Sunday, I was the only experienced staff with two newbies, or as I call them, noobs. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got noobs. We did not have a lot going on because it's a quiet Sunday in the cottage I usually work in. They're older, so after they get breakfast and everything done, most of them sit down to watch CBS. Doesn't matter what's on CBS, they just watch CBS. I don't get it. 
and uh, they usually kind of doze off during uh, Face the Nation. And whenever I say, Walter Concrete to come back, you know, do you guys really want to watch this or do you want to watch something? Else? Nope, Channel Four. So they doze off while watching Face the Nation. I'm working on lunch. All of a sudden, I hear the two noobs go, "Ew! Ah! Oh, ah!" Oh. I come out, and one of the clients who was sleeping um, has had, we aren't to call them accidents anymore, so I'll call it an incident. Wait, that's our line. An incident. Where, um, well, one of the things about the group home that I don't talk about much is everybody is on um, pills to help them poo. <laughs> because the diet they have is, you know, very Midwestern. Meat, taters, Potatoes. meat, taters, Starts. meat, taters. So uh, he's been uh, taking a whole bunch of stuff to help him become more regular, and he was regular all the way down to a puddle on the floor. And uh, one, as I get in there, you know, they're kind of freaking out, and uh, I say, okay, Let's just get him in the bathroom, get him a shower, get him cleaned up. And one of the staff says, I'm taking my 15-minute break. <laughs> and I said, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. <laughs> I uh, help, you know, and he's he was napping. So I go, you know, I'm just going to use a fake name. Bob, Bob, are you okay? Are you okay? Huh? What? Are you okay? Huh? Got that, uh, you know, you just snapped me out of a deep sleep. So we get him in, get him showered up. I mop the floor, get his clothing changed. Joe, there was a puddle of liquid poo. He's in a wheelchair. It surrounded the wheelchair and, a ra and further. And that's all that had gone down his leg. So he's in the shower and we get him cleaned up. We get him out. And I, you know, have to take his vitals because he was unresponsive. How many fingers do you see? All of that. Fifteen minutes later, the staff, you know, said, can I go on my break now? Yeah, you could go on my break now. He turns to the other staff and says, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> to which I tell that staff, get him in there now. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my Sunday morning, noobs and liquid poo. Joe, what are you geeking on? Well, other than the fact you just reminded me, for Hip Watch, I have a huge book to read about uh, getting ready for my hip. Well, not really a book, but, I mean, it's like a magazine size, definitely super special size. And, you know, one of the fun things I'll get to take uh, after that is, uh, you know, they're going to have to give me a laxative because I won't be able to really, hell, I won't be able to sit at a right angle until I get my muscles back out. Uh, that was not what I was going to talk about, though, because for Hip Watch, I'm actually, I'm still working really well. Everything's working well, a little pain. Uh, I'll find out. Let's see, where are we here? I will find out not this next podcast coming up, but the podcast afterwards, if everything is green light to go get the operation done. Uh so, and it's looking good. The blood sugars are, are low. Uh, I think the blood pressure's in check. So I just got to, like I said, read through the book, kind of get prepped up to ask them what kind of questions I need to know. Uh, I did have my 35th class reunion on, on uh, Saturday. 35 uh, years. I know. Can you believe it? Uh, it was tough because I couldn't get off work, but I was talking with my boss and She's like, well, where'd you go to school? Uh, well, St. Bernard's High School. And she started laughing. She said, that's where I went. What class? 83? And then she's like, I, I wasn't even born then. <laughs> she's like, she was like maybe two or something. But <laughs> So that was kind of funny. So I was able to get off early. And it was weird leaving work because it was still daylight. Because uh, usually I, I get there at noon. And I go underground, I come out, and it's, like, dark. So, but it was fun. Uh, I catched up. Not a lot of people at this one as they were at the 30. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the venue. One of the guys was like, you know, we're kind of really off the grid. You know, we're not near a height. We're not near a street. To me, we're at halftime wreck, 
which is uh, on Front Street in St. Paul, which is only like about three blocks from where I grew up. And uh, so it's like me, it's like old home day, you know. Uh, but I could see other people coming out of town. It's kind of like the way my comic shop was. It was on a main street, but I was like two and a half miles north of I-94 and a mile and a half south of Highway 36 and six miles south of four or 694. So, uh, but being on the main street, it was a little easier. It was also 35. And, and you know, the fives don't seem to have as big as important as the zeros. I kind of disagree with that because I'm kind of like, you know what? I'm only going to have one, and if I'm lucky, I'll be here five years from now, and uh, that's no health comment. That's just uh, you don't know what the hell's going to happen between here and there. So I, it was fun. I, I talked to different people, ran into some friends, ran into uh, a dear friend from high school, that one of my best friends, uh, and he said something very butch-like to me. I just feel terrible. I don't get a hold of you much anymore. And I'm like, you know what? I, I'm not going to really poo-poo you on it, but I'm like, hey, we're living life. What can I say? And if anything's important, you'll pick up that phone, you'll grab the email, get on the Facebook, interweb, Twitter, whatever, and reach out for your to your friend. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's amazing that Corey and I at least get to do this podcast every week. Uh, and, you know, before and after – we just sit, we kind of catch up. Some of it makes it to the show, but some of it doesn't, especially the stuff about the incident. But, uh, you know, if it doesn't, it, just reach out to your friends and just, uh, you know, let them know. Just say hi, even if you can't get together for a drink or a, a nice rare steak sandwich with, with extra crisp fries. I'm sorry, someone just posted that on my Facebook page. Damn, I'm getting hungry. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Oh, I actually got a chance to read some stuff uh, from Action Lab. Action Lab. Action Lab. Out of their danger zone line is Black Betty. Uh, I talked about this book a while back because it was a free comic book day solicitation of it. And it intrigued me enough to go I, – I wasn't going to buy the series, but I, I did luck out, and I bought the book when it finally came out. This came – I think I just got this in my last box day, so it should be out. But Black Betty essentially is – she makes a living killing the unkillable. She's taken on all the monsters in every shape and size with a style all of her own, but when a man's daughter is kidnapped by a local legend, Betty steps in to save her for a price. If you need it dead and you've got the cash, Betty's your girl. Uh, let's see, from the creative team that brought you Charles Band's Puppet Master, also I believe through Action Lab, Sean Gabarin and uh, uh, Micah Da Sacco. So well drawn, a fun book. You know, it, it's kind of mystic orientated, and I keep thinking, boy, that would be a fun crossover with Doctor Strange. Uh, I read from Source Point Press, The Rejected. And this is just a creepy as hell black and white. Did not go where I expected it to go. And uh, kind of left me with an unsettled feeling, which, you know, for a comic book ain't that bad, to tell you the truth. This is a, a one shot. Uh, I Hopefully your better comic stores will have it. Otherwise, you could probably go to sourcepointpress.com and pick it up. And I read a book. Uh, and, you know, oddly enough, these are all books I probably raved about when I'm doing a previews review. But from Lion Forge came out Love Letters to Jane's World by Paige yes. Brad Braddock. And I have no idea if she listens to our show. Probably not. Uh, she actually, I, I got to say, I know I had Jane's World in my big store. I had the books. I had the comics. I uh, never read them. I might have read onesie, twosies. Uh, it's a web strip, I believe. Or was it? Yeah, not a syndicated strip, but a web strip. Uh, and she's got some, uh, I mean, accolades behind her because she's right now the chief creative officer at Charles M. Schultz Creative Associates and worked with Schultz, I believe, in developing her own strip. And rather than go syndicated, she went uh, syndicated online, if I'm saying that right. Yep. And the book, it makes me want to go out and, well, first of all, I'm kicking myself that I sold her books 
on the Ebays or at the uh, MCBO charity shops. I wish now, maybe I should have kept them. But uh, it gives you just enough to deal with. Uh, apparently, she's been doing this strip for 20 years. And uh, the Jane's Will is kind of an essential collection, gathers the most notable stories. Uh, the comic strip, uh, let's see, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the character's a lesbian main character, just so you're not shocked. The new volume pairs quintessential stories about the relatable, fallible Jane with love letters from notable fans, as well as notes and musing from the creator herself. So it's an awesome way just to check it out. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I really, I, I will probably be now hunting down other Jane's World stuff, you know, kicking myself that, yeah, I had it at one time and now I don't. Uh, I did finally get around to reading Hey Kids Comics by Howard Chaikin. Corey raved about it. I will second rave about it. Uh, and uh, I, I imagine issue two is out. But uh, like I said, I just finished reading one. Just for the hell of it, I reread The Books of Magic. Because now that uh, Tim Hunter is coming back in the new Vertigo uh, Sandman universe line, I thought I'd get a get a jive to see what the old one was. So I'm not sure where they're going with the new one, but I am looking forward to trying it. The original uh, Books of Magic was, was supposed to be the redefining of magic in the DC universe because it was really kind of hard and loose. And it, there's characters that take the... Uh, non-magical Tim Hunter through the past. And of course, this is back when they tied it all into the DC universe. So you're seeing the past DC comics, uh, the, the current magic users, the uh, magic realms, including Sandman uh, Dreaming, and then a very odd character called Mr. E. That's M-R dot E, not Mr. E. I'm sure the pun was intended. Takes him into the future. And there is a follow-up Mr. E uh, series. There's also a Book of Magic. Is that what it was called? The actual series? Yep, Books of Magic. And then they uh, th there's one graphic novel out that I raved about a number of months ago. So you can still follow along with the originals, how the new stuff's going. But this, the, the one issue that uh, is probably my favorite of this series is the uh, second issue where uh, John Constantine is basically taking Tim through the current run of DC Universe. And, of course, the Spectre's a little different because back then he was uh, paired to a recently resu resurrected uh, Jim Constantine. How do you say it? Constantine? Yep. And uh, he hung out with uh, Madame Xandu and was paired down to... Uh, Mostly just a one-on-one -on -one level. He wasn't the cosmic threat he, he was before. But my favorite scene in it was when uh, they go to see Zandu. I'm sorry, Zantana Zandu. See, I'm still thinking super specials. Hey, at least I stopped doing the bat dong the jokes. Uh, Zantana. And they go to a, on Halloween night, go to a bar where all the magic users hang out. And, of course, they, they decide, since there's a head on Tim's body, there's a price on his head, which need not be attached to his body. They all start to turn on him. And then all of a sudden, you, you, you can, this is comic book, so you're not hearing it, but you can hear it. All of a sudden, a match strikes, and it raises to J John Constantine's mouth. And the waitress, Constantine, she drops the drink, and he just says, nobody touches that boy. The boy's mine, and in 30 seconds, me and him and the witch are going to walk out of here. You know who I am, or you ought to. You know my reputation. Now, does anyone really want to start something? Right, come on, you lot, we're leaving. Oh, my God, that has got to be my two favorite pages of comics. Beautifully drawn by Scott Hampton. Uh, the whole series is fantastic. And if you have never, geez, I'm raving more about this than the new stuff. But, uh, I mean, Neil Gaiman wrote it. Charles Vest did an issue. Paul Johnson, John Bolton, and then Scott Hampton. Just a fabulous book. I don't believe it has any bearing on the current DC universe, but nevertheless, as a standalone, it's still kind of fun. So uh, I definitely recommend uh, uh, going out of your way. And, you know, if you can't find the, the, the comics themselves are in prestige format, I'd go buy the trade. Probably a little bit easier to read. Corey, what are you geeking on? 
Um, well, first, uh, one of the podcasts that I have uh, been recommending forever is Colt Cabana's Art of Wrestling. He recently, one of the things in Art of Wrestling, he always has a pro wrestling related song. And sometimes it's a song that was around for a while. Sometimes it's a new song that people have sent him. But what he has done, if you go out to his uh, YouTube page, he has taken all of those songs and made them into a playlist. So if you want to listen to a couple hundred songs about pro wrestling, just go to the YouTubes and search for Colt Cabana, and there you go. And uh, now I know what I'm going to be listening to when I'm uh, reading comics. Uh, the second thing is, Joe, it's that time of year. I went to Target. They have the monster cereals. <sighs> they have Booberry, they have Count Chocula, they have Frankenberry, and this year the marshmallows are shaped like monsters. Is there anything better than that? I don't think so. Are, are you still there? Kaboom, but that's not out yet. No, Kaboom. I, I haven't seen Kaboom in a long time. Uh, Comic-wise... Turn your poop green is in my book. Okay. Booberry used to do that. Oh, maybe I have to get a box. Yeah, there you go. I don't know if they still do it. They didn't do it the last couple of years when I ate it. Yeah, not a but, lot of iron around. But then again, I didn't eat like you know, four bowls of it at once. Mm -hmm. Um. The, the uh, team of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips have announced that the comic Criminal is coming back. It will be a monthly series, picking up where it left off. Um, some of the stories will be one issue long. Some will be four or five. Some will be six or seven. But uh, that was the comic that they did over at Marvel in the Icon line. They've done other books at uh, Image. But after they have completed all... My heroes have always been junkies. They are bringing back Criminal, and I could not be happier. I am so happy they're bringing that comic back. Um, That's based on the Michael Jackson song, right? Smooth Criminal. Do, 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 do. You need a bat pole. I do. Um, somebody scanned not me. Oh. every issue they could find of Comic Values Monthly and the Comics Reader. Joe, does Joe know what those two magazines are? Well, Comic Values Monthly was, as it said, a monthly magazine. When back when I was uh, not only having the comic store, but also having uh, going to cons before that, there were three books you had to use. Overstreet being good only for pretty much Golden Age, Silver Age, but to get current values, you had to use Wizard, Comic Buyer's Guide, which again was always behind, and then Comic Values Monthly. Sometimes it was a race to see who had the most expensive prices to see who would to cover it. But Comics Value Monthly was great because it, it was just that. Just comic values, almost everything they had. Uh, you could actually probably use it for a good checklist. And then, of course, next month would be something else. Comics Reader, I don't remember who published it, was uh, very similar. Oh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It was just a magazine a comic book size book when I had it, just dealing with uh, monthly comics that are coming out. Kind of, this is what's coming from this yeah, company. Yeah, was the TV what's guide of comics. comics. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a better analogy of it than what I was going for. Uh, the one I have uh, might have sold it. It was it had like the death of Stan Lee. Just kidding, April Fools. You know, and very small mm -hmm. print on the bottom. But these were kind of before the high gloss era of wizard and you fancy online comic resources, newsarama guys, these, this is what we use to figure out what the hell was coming up. Unless you had uh, access to a uh, retailer catalog, like, uh, well, for the comics book. retailer, I'm sorry for the comics reader. That was before there were retailer catalogs. Yeah. So again, we didn't have advanced comics or, or previews, or I'm trying to think of what Heroes Weekly used to call, or Heroes World used to call their their one. So, yeah, these were the Bibles we we used to figure out values in that. And of course, the the inherent danger of that was they were always reporting on what was hot. So you're saying, oh look, this is worth uh, fifty bucks. Well, it's probably worth sixty bucks by the time you figured it out. And I believe the other fun thing with Comic Values Monthly was it had. Uh, dealers talking about what's hot and what's not. Yes. 
which is something, you know, when Wizard did it, they just did it like the top five, top ten. So as a not only as a retailer, but as a uh, weekend warrior, which we recall back then, these were must read books. And Comic Values Monthly also started when the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hit and went insane. And hey, whoa, 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 pay up. I want my dime. Okay, here you go. Jeez. Shiny new dime. But Comics right. Value Monthly, I'm reading the early issues, and it was very much, um, here's what to invest in. Ooh. So they would actually look at the new Marvel books coming out, and the new DC books coming out, and the indie books coming out, and they would say whether they were a good investment or not. Now, from what you read, were they right? Um, for the time, uh, yeah. No, no, I'm talking about now. Oh, no. Because you know, most of that crap, it went up and then it went down. I'm reading for the black and white boom and bust. And a lot of the ones they're pointing out, like Fish Police and, um, uh, let's see, what were some of the others? They, they really oh, pushed um, Nat Rat. Uh, uh, gangrene, Kangaroo, Jertusu, Gerbil, Penguins. I mean, it doesn't matter how many different adjectives you could put in front of an animal name. They were hot. Well, these are the ones they point out, you know, adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters will do okay, but Nat Rat will probably do better. Or uh, uh, Fish Police is coming out. We've seen this. It looks really good. Um, expect this to blow up in value. Um, some yeah, of the ones I... they point out, you just kind of shake your head and go, you guys were smoking some crack huh? because you should have invested in Crystar the Crystal Warriors. No, 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 no. But they're really fun to read. Uh, the comics readers start in about 1974 when Paul Levitz, whatever became of him, mm -hmm. he was the oh, editor. Hey, he ran a store, right? You love it at Levitz. <laughs> but he was the editor. So I will give a dime to whoever gets that reference, by the way. <laughs> I love the fact that he's got all this DC news, and then when it comes to Marvel, it's, well, you know, uh, I've heard this, and I've heard this. But, man, he was keyed in because he was like, in an upcoming issue of this, this is going to happen. Um, he actually has the story. The first one I read is where he breaks the story that Kirby is leaving Jimmy Olsen. Oh, those Don Rickles appearances didn't do what they thought. Well, it sold well enough, but they basically it's okay. We want Kirby to do something else. Um, the uh, final thing that I'm geeking on in doing my research for the uh, Fantastic Forecast, I'm reading my Fantastic Fours in the Omnibus. Now, I've read them in Marvel. I mean, you're not going to pull out your mint copy of Fantastic Four number one and thumb through it? Well, only after I've eaten uh, buffalo wings. Oh, I thought maybe after blueberry, but uh, never mind. But uh, I've read it as uh, reprints in the uh, what Marvel Tales and Marvel greatest comics and um let's see uh, the uh the the essentials the masterworks on the uh, marvel app but the omnibus prints them from what was printed in the comic and there were things they reprint the uh letters pages and uh i i mentioned it in the podcast some of these letters are fake and you can tell because it's the names of inkers and office people who worked at Marvel. <laughs> um, also, in the fourth issue, along the bottom of the page, you know how in the 70s they had the little thing at the bottom of the page kind of hyping other Marvel books that were coming out? Mm -hmm. They were doing that in Fantastic Four number four because it's, who is the Hulk? The Hulk is coming. What is the Hulk? So... That I found really interesting. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that they were doing that sort of thing back then. Because they've never reprinted that stuff. They've just reprinted it, you know, just the art pages, not Stan's little blurbs at the top and bottom of the pages. So I wonder how far that goes. But it's, I think, um, well, when you listen to the episode, you'll hear me talk about how the letters were obviously faked. And, um... Some of the names that come up for the, the people who send in the fake letters will give you a smile. Believe it or not, kids. And I don't. You've listened to us blather on about funny books and bat poles for over an hour and a half. 
What's wrong with you? I mean, I mean, thank you. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. Joe? There is no substantive due process right to stimulate one's genitals for non-medical purposes unrelated to procreation or outside an interpersonal relationship. Ted Cruz. Hit my music.